Hello everyone, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Nikolai Matni. Nikolai, thanks so much to you for coming. You, you had a late arrival. Uh, Nikolai comes to us from Penn, uh, where he is a professor in the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department and in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences, right? It's like the RCS department. And Nikolai is also a visiting researcher at Google. And prior to, uh, to these uh, already very famous locations, Nikolai has been also at great places. He has been a postdoc at UC Berkeley and at Caltech. And at Caltech, he also did his PhD. But originally, Nikolai is actually a Canada native. He did his undergrad in Vancouver at UBC and uh, grew up in Montreal. And uh, it's nice that you come back to the middle of these two places which, uh, in which you spend so much, uh, so much time and we're super grateful to have you, to have you in Toronto. Uh, your work speaks for yourself. You got some super cool awards, I think best paper awards at ACC and, uh, and CDC. And, and uh, you also got the NSF Career Award um, and the Google, Google's Research Award. So, a lot of really cool work that, that has been recognized by, by these famous places and now we are very excited to hear from you about a super important topic uh, and uh, to find out what it is that makes learning to control easy or hard. Thanks so much for being here and we look forward to your talk. Great, thank you so much for the intro Igor, very happy to be here. Thank you to all of you for making it out on this rainy day, appreciate you doing that. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm not talking directly to the mic. Is the sound okay for, for Zoom? Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, you know, the work that we do in my group uh, is really aimed at trying to think about how to combine learning, dynamics, control, optimization, and principled way uh, with a particular focus on, on safety critical applications, trying to ensure that we get strong guarantees within the performance or robustness. Um, you know, I think over the last five or six years, everybody has done a really good job. The community at large has done a good job in terms of motivating why this is important, right? I think we've all seen the video of you know, the self-driving car driving where it should in or the robot falling over. Uh, so what I would like to do is instead motivate our, uh, the, the, you know, the results that I'm gonna talk about today from a slightly different perspective that I think might actually appeal to you, know, maybe speak a little bit more to the grad students in the, in, the, in the audience, which is, oh, that's not working, there we go, which is this idea of graduate student descent, right? I think we've all been there. We come up with this great idea, we go and then we decide, okay, I'm gonna code this up and see how it does, and no matter what I do, I can't get these stupid Mujoko things to do what I want them to, right? And I start fiddling with hyperparameters, staring at training curves, and after a week or a month or a year of staring at these, I start to have nightmares about them. And the question then really becomes, you know, why isn't this working? What's going on here? Uh, is it just that I haven't yet quite hit on that perfect sweet spot of hyperparameters, network architecture, exploration strategy, etc.? That's one setting. Or could it just be that the problem that I'm trying to solve is just fundamentally hard? And that even if I was able to somehow find the best possible controller, I would still get crappy performance. Uh, no, I mean, I know this is kind of a funny thing to look at, but I think what is somewhat maybe frustrating um, is the fact that right now, we don't really have a principled way of disambiguating these two cases, right? Especially with the finickiness, the finickiness of deep reinforcement learning and deep learning more generally in terms of its sensitivity to hyperparameters. So broadly what today's talk is gonna be about is us trying to make some progress towards systematically separating these two cases. One where learning is hard and one where learning is easy. Sorry, learning to control. Uh, and to do this, we're gonna take inspiration from a different field of applied math that is actually able, has tools to do exactly this in the context of deterministic systems, the systems where there is no real data-driven component. Uh, and that's the field of robust control. Um, and so for those of you who have suffered through a graduate robust control class, you may have heard of something like H infinity or mu synthesis. Uh, and those are probably the more famous results of robust control. But um, what I'm gonna try to convince you of today is that in fact, one of the more practically important and impactful aspects of robust control that's maybe a little bit underappreciated is that it also allows you to identify fundamental limits of control. Another way of saying this is that it's able to delineate quantitatively the fact that there are some systems for which all controllers just perform really, really badly. Um, the canonical example that um, I like to use in my classes, and I got this from my PhD advisor, is this idea of balancing a stick on your hand. Right? You can try this at home if you have one of the old school pointers. 
Uh, and it turns out that if you analyze this from a control theoretic perspective, you can actually quantify how easy or hard it is to keep this thing balanced. Uh, so in particular, if you study the transfer function of this system, we can characterize the unstable pole as in, ter in terms as being um, inversely related to the length of the stick. So what this tells us is that if the stick is shorter, it's a lot harder to balance. And if you try this, you'll actually see that that's true. Um, but you can make things even harder if you allow the stick to be long again, but then put like a baseball cap on or something, so you only get to see the middle of the stick. This introduces an unstable zero that as you look further and further down actually starts to sit on top of this unstable pole. And what this means from a practical perspective is that you're losing the ability to actually observe or control the unstable mode that's making your stick fall over. Right, and so particularly the way to think about this is as I look farther and farther down, I lose the ability to actually keep this thing up, right? The noise due to like depth perception gets amplified more and more. Right, so if you find yourself in this situation, this is a toy example, but you can imagine more realistic versions of this where a combination of hard dynamics and maybe crappy sensing lead you, get you into trouble. The question then becomes, okay, I've identified this, do I stop, do I give up? No, right, I mean, that's not what you wanna do. As an engineer, you wanna use this insight to close a co-design loop. And this tells you that you need to change your system. So for this case, right, this is a, you know, the idea that I'm looking at the bottom of the stick, it's a toy example of bad sensing. And this would tell me that I would need to either change the physics or change the sensors on my system to make this an easier to control system. So the, the idea for today is we're gonna see if we can carry over these same kinds of ideas and insights over to the learning enabled control setting and see if we could actually develop our own sort of co-design setting, identify problem settings where, the, where problems are hard and identify ways to fix them. And conversely, also identify settings where it's actually easy to learn to control. What are good properties of our system? Um, you know, so at a high level, the question that we're trying to study in my group is what makes learning controllers from dynamic data easy or hard? And the informal meta theorem that we started to converge towards is um, one that you may kind of hope to see, which is that good optimal controllers, controllers that lead to good closed loop performance, these should actually be pretty easy to learn from data. If the, if the best controller that I'm chasing after actually leads to good performance, it shouldn't be too hard to find it. Similarly, if I'm in the scenario like I had on the previous slide where even the best controller gives me crappy behavior, then it's actually gonna be really hard to find that best bad controller. Uh, and so this could be indicative of the fact that, you know, this could be indicated by, for example, lots of variants when you're running policy gradient or something. This could be a hint that maybe it's not that I don't have the right hyperparameters, but it's really that I have just a fundamentally hard problem underneath the hood. And maybe I should change something about my problem to make it easier. Okay, so the rest of the talk today is really gonna be about unpacking and making the statement a little bit more formal. We're gonna start off with the bad news, get that out of the way first, and we're gonna look at what makes learning uh, controllers hard. We're gonna start with just looking at linear systems, which I know are not particularly exciting, but over the last four or five years in the learning for dynamics and control community, we've really started to nail down what makes it easy to learn a linear system and learn to control it. So we're gonna take a look at the positive, system, positive results that are in the literature and maybe try to unpack them a little bit and see if in certain cases there may be hiding something that might actually lead to hardness. Uh, and then we'll actually see that some linear systems are indeed hard to control despite these existing positive results in the literature. Then, you know, we, at this point we've gotten the um, bad news out of the way and we're gonna move over to the good news. Um, so as I mentioned, the linear setting is quite well understood in the community right now. So in this context, we're actually gonna think a little bit more broadly in terms of nonlinear systems. We're certainly not tackling the um, full nonlinear optimal control or reinforcement learning in its full generality. In fact, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus in on an imitation learning problem as a case study. And what we'll identify there is that if I have an expert that leads to a robust uh, uh, closed loop, uh, and we're gonna specify exactly what we mean by this, then this actually can be taken into account and lead to, to um, sample efficient and safe imitation learning. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. Okay, so let's start with uh, learning to control linear systems and just set the stage for what we're gonna be talking about. So in this context, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we're gonna have our system S described by the following linear time invariant dynamics. Here, X re represents my system state. So this could be, for example, the configuration space of my robot or something like that. A describes the autonomous dynamics of my system, so how it, ev how it evolves if I just hands off. Um, U corresponds to the actuation, my control inputs, and B maps the control inputs to the evolution on the state. 
And then I have this disturbance process, which is making my life difficult. This is kind of the external world, and this is what I have to, to deal with. Uh, and the goal in general here is to regulate this system to zero despite the driving noise from the disturbance. Typically, you can imagine this is a linearization about some de desired equilibrium. Okay. Um, and we're going to use uh, both the task of stabilization and the, the task of LQR optimal control, which is really kind of the least squares of optimal control as a baseline. So in LQR optimal control, the goal is to try to find some policy pi um, that minimizes the steady state weighted sum of the variance of my state and actuation. Right, so this really captures kind of the energy transfer from the disturbance process W to um, my state deviations and my control action. So in this setting, we're going to assume stochastic ones. Okay. Now you may be looking at this and thinking, okay, um, you know, we're, you, know you, you all work in robotics. Nothing is linear in the robot. Nothing in the robotics world is linear. But I'm going to try to convince you that there's, this is still worth studying in the sense that. Um, linear systems in LQR are useful as benchmarks for learning to control systems in the sense that they are simple enough to analyze. We can actually write down closed form expressions for the optimal controller, for estimates of the state space matrices and things like that. Um, and while they're not fully general, they're still general enough to capture some of the kind of essential challenges that come into play from learning over data generated by a dynamical system. Right, so this is certainly not super broad and all encompassing but it still allows us to get some good insight in terms of what makes learning easier. Okay, so with that in mind, let's just get a, take a quick overview of positive results in this space. Positive results that show us that, in fact, learning to control linear systems are, is easy. So we're gonna consider two types of tasks. The first task is gonna be that of what I'm gonna call an offline task where I get to you know, do whatever I want to the system to collect data, and then my goal is just to synthesize a control policy that leads to a stable closed loop, that leads to this thing not blowing up on me. Um, and so you, know, you can formalize this as I'm given some unknown system, I don't know A or B, and I want to find a feedback controller K so that the spectral radius of this closed loop matrix is less than one. And uh, you know, a sample of the kinds of results that exist in the literature in this space say that if I connect, collect enough data, where here enough data means something that's polynomial in the underlying ambient state image n, maybe scaled by some uh, system-dependent constant, then with high probability I'll have, um, I'll have that my system is, close is stable and closed loop. Just as an example of what a typical algorithm would look like in this context to really kind of concretize things, typically what people do is during the experiment phase, the offline phase, they just inject a bunch of white noise into the system and they use this to generate a trajectory of data, x, t, and u, t, right? You, we assume in this case, super simple, I get to measure everything. I get to measure x and u, so I get access to the state and the control input. Once I collect this data, I, saw, I just solve a least squares problem that, um, that, that fits the data as, as, as well as possible. So this should be an x and t plus one, not a t sub one. Right, so basically I'm just trying to find an a and b that explains my data as well as possible. You think of this as an MLE, because we're assuming Gaussian noise. The output of this is then going to be some nominal estimates a hat and b hat, and then maybe using some statistical analysis, you could also characterize some error bounds epsilon a and epsilon b. And then you feed these into some control algorithm that outputs a approximate controller k hat. This could be a certain equivalent controller where I just use a hat and b hat, or it could be something like robust control that actually takes into account the uncertainty. Right. So all of these, you know, these references that I have down here. They apply, they, they apply some flavor of this, of this result and analyze it end to end, combining control and statistics to give you these kinds of results. Okay. So this is one task. This is the offline sample complexity, ta uh, sample complexity of stabilization. Another task that is equally important but somewhat different is that of um, an online task, which is what I'm going to call regret bounds for LQR. Another way of saying this is I'm trying to develop an adaptive controller that converges towards the optimal controller as I go. Uh, right, so in the previous setting, I get to just collect data offline. It doesn't matter what my system does during the data collection step. Here, I actually care about the running cost that I incur. So again, we're in this setup where I have an unknown system, but now, rather than just trying to find a stabilizing controller, I actually want to minimize this regret. And what this regret is doing is it's computing the running sum between the cost that I incur, and I'm comparing it to the optimal cost had I known the true controller. That's what this minus TJ star thing. And again, in this context, we have positive results. This is now we understand how to do this. Uh, and we can say that with probability at least one minus delta, 
we have regret that scales um, with square root t. So this is good because this means that um, I'm converging to the optimal controller at a rate that looks like one over square root t. Um, and that's polynomial again in the ambient state dimension. So this is tractable. Um, okay. And again, just to give you an idea of what a typical algorithm looks like here, it's essentially the algorithm from the previous slide kind of wrapped in a closed loop. So at every time step, I'm going to collect, at every epoch, I'm going to split time up into epochs, collect some data, fit a model using that data, then apply a controller using those estimates of my system. And then the only slight difference here is that that bottom line, I'm not just going to play the controller itself, I'm also going to inject a little bit of noise to help me explore and get a better estimate of the underlying A and B matrices. And the trick here is just to scale this noise and make it less and less as I go further and further and my model estimates are better and better. So this is a kind of typical algorithm that, look, that, that you would see in this literature. And you can show that this leads to, in some sense, order optimal regret. Right, so the main takeaway here is that the results in the literature show that kind of doing the obvious thing, just collecting data from exciting the system, fitting a model with least squares, and then applying a controller that's based off of those nominal estimates gives you, in some sense, statistically the best controller you can get. Right? So this seems to indicate that learning to control linear systems is, in fact, very easy right? from a computational complexity or statistical complexity perspective. So let's dig into this a little bit right? and see if something's actually being hidden. And I'm going to pick on um, one of my first results in this space which shows that if you apply kind of that pipeline that I showed you a couple of slides before, where you do a little bit of robust control as well, you can show that if, um, you know, if I apply least squares plus robust control, I'll get a stabilizing controller. If I have enough data, where enough data is given by something that scales like the state dimension, the control input dimension, and the minimum eigenvalue of this controllability gradient, which basically measures the directions in the state space, which are easier or harder to, ex to, um, to excite. Similarly, in the online setting, I'm going to pick on a friend of mine's paper where they show that exactly the, the, um, the algorithm that I showed you on the previous slide gives you this order optimal, um, this order optimal uh, regret bound where this P star here is the, is the solution of a discrete algebraic Mercati equation. So this is something that's characterizing in some sense the steady state um, variance of your system in close loop. So again, if you look at this, this suggests that this is an easy to learn problem in the sense that everything requires polynomial amounts of data about the underlying system. But what I want to hint at, what I want to suggest is that these constants at the bottom here, which rely upon, um, which depend on the underlying control theoretic uh, properties of the system, are not necessarily in fact constant. These things can actually get really badly behaved depending on the system that you're looking at. Right, so what we're going to do in the next few slides is really unpack what these constants here might actually be hiding. Because right, these are positive results. So these show that learning is easy. So the only way for learning to be hard is if something here is not, is not exactly telling the whole story. So we're going to try to unpack that a little bit. Um, and so let me also just mention, if you have any questions at any point, just interrupt me. Feel free to ask, ask away. Um, so uh, our starting point for this line of work is going to be a paper from my colleagues at, uh, at, um, at Penn that shows that, forget about controlling the system, suppose I just want to learn, I, 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 suppose I, sorry, do you have a question back? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask if there's any connection to the systems of excitation. Yeah, absolutely. That's going to come up later. So um, it's going to be especially important, it's going to be important in both the stabilization and the regret bounds. Um, but you know, as a foreshadowing, uh, in, in especially this term here, the, this is really a, direct, uh, a quantitative measure of the least excitable mode. And so this kind of quantifies how hard it is to get that PE condition that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so our starting point is going to be this, the, the setting where I just want to identify the dynamics of my system. Forget about controlling it. I just have an autonomous system. It's evolving in the world. And I want to try to um, learn this A matrix here. Okay? And to do this, I get access to, X, to, to, to measurements of x. And I just get to measure the state, the, the state transitions. Um, the difference between this result and existing results in the literature is they make this what I think is a fairly reasonable assumption, which is that the process noise is not necessarily directly actuating all of the states. Right? If you think of a system that's like a double integrator or something, you don't expect there to be noise in the velocity or position directly, but rather noise in just the acceleration. Right? That's kind of what this is capturing. Okay? And so what they showed was that you can in fact construct interesting systems. And I'll We'll, we'll explain what an interesting system is in the next couple of slides, for which this minimum controllability gradient is in fact exponentially small in the ambient state space dimension. 
And you know, combining this with information theoretic lower bounds, they're able to show that I'm really only able to get a good estimate of this matrix A if I collect exponentially many data points, where exponential, this exponential is in the ambient state dimension. So you know, for those of you who are maybe a little bit less familiar with the learning theoretic um, kind of sample complexity bounds, exponential is bad, right? As soon as n becomes, uh, as soon as n becomes something on the order of like 15 or 20, and let's say rho is equal to a half, you're in a lot of trouble. This means you need a ton of data to get a good estimate of your system dynamics. Okay, so this starts to hint at the fact that, you know, maybe things aren't quite as rosy in, in this, even in this linear systems world. That being said, though, um, it's not clear that this leads to bad control, in the sense that maybe these modes that are hard to excite, I can just ignore them. Right? It could be that you know, these are just not very important to the system dynamics and I can ignore them and I can still get my hands on a good controller. Right? So what we're gonna show next is that there are in fact systems that, for which that's not true. You actually do have to worry about these kinds of things. Okay, so the, you know, and this is very much related to the question about persistence of excitation, is we're gonna do a little bit of a dive into the role of controllability here and how this manifests itself in terms of sample complexity bounds. So again, you know, for those of you who have blacked out the, uh, your, 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 your uh, controls classes, um, a quick little reminder of what it means for a linear system like this to be controllable. So what you do is you construct this controllability matrix, which is given by B and then different powers of A pre-multiplying it, uh, and you go up to the K minus one power. And if this thing has full row rank, I keep forgetting to change the column to row, full row rank for some K less than or equal to N, then I have a controllable system. What this essentially means from a practical perspective is that after k time steps, I can move the state of my system from anywhere to anywhere else. That's essentially what this means from a practical perspective. So the smaller k is, the easier it is to control my system in terms of its degrees of actuation. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna make clear is that controllability is not enough to actually have a system that's easy to learn. And you can construct a very easy pathological example here. So it's a two-state system. The first, the bottom state is where my control input enters through here. Um, and it's coupled to the first state via this parameter alpha here. Right? Now, if you stare at this a little bit, you should be able to convince yourself that um, in, order to learn, in, in order to learn to stabilize the system, I need to identify alpha. Um, but as alpha, gets arbitrarily small, it becomes increasingly difficult to actually identify this parameter because it's being drowned out by the noise. Right? Intuitively, that's kind of what's happening. And so this is not super interesting, right? We're basically saying that we're making this arbitrarily small coupling between difference, between where my actuation enters and the state I need to identify. So we want to eliminate this. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this controllability Gramian object that showed up on the previous slide. Uh, and again, what the controllability Gramian measures is really the, how easy or hard it is to excite the system in the particular eigenvector directions. The bigger the eigenvalue, the easier it is to, to excite my system in that direction of the state space. And so what was implicitly assumed in prior work is that one over the minimum eigenvalue of this thing was actually well behaved. It was polynomial in the ambient state. So what we're gonna show next is that they're actually what I'm gonna call interesting systems, so systems that don't suffer from this kind of pathological property here, that actually lead to very bad one over lambda min. There are gonna be directions in the state space that are really, really hard to, to excite. Okay, so this is gonna be the, 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 the mathiest slide of the talk, and I'll talk you through it and then we can forget everything about it, okay? Um, so to be able to characterize this notion of interesting systems, I have to introduce this idea of staircase or Hessenberg form for systems. So the idea here is that if my system is controllable, then there exists a unitary matrix so that I can apply a state transformation so that my B and A matrices have this nice kind of, this nice form. And the key takeaways from this are the following. One is the number of blocks in this A matrix here, kind of the block uh, uh, height of these matrices is given by this mi the minimum k where I get full rank in my controllability matrix. Another way of thinking about this is how long it takes me, how long would it take me to move from one state to another arbitrary state. Another way to think about this is it's a measure of the underactuation of my system. If kappa is equal to one, that means I have a fully actuated system. I can go from anywhere to anywhere in one time step. If kappa is equal to n, then I have a really underactuated system. It takes me n time steps to go from one state to another. Okay. 
So that's key point number one. And then key point number two is that by putting it in the staircase form here, we have this very explicit um, characterization of how different, I'm going to call them subsystems, are coupled to each other. So the input comes in at the top, and then it gets propagated down to these other subsystems by the, via these like lower block diagonal entries. And so we can very cleanly now make sure that we're not in this bad pathological setting by enforcing that each of these blocks that are in red here are lower bounded by mu. So none of these can be smaller than some constant mu. Right? So we're no longer, so this Im immediately eliminates the example on the previous slide where I let alpha go to zero. Right? In this case, alpha would only be allowed to get as small as mu. So the main takeaway here is we're putting in this, this fancy form that allows us to really explicitly characterize the coupling between states, and we're making sure that, there's, that in no case here, in no setting, is it possible for us to have arbitrarily small coupling between subsystems. Okay. So this is going to be our class of interesting systems for which we're going to show you can still get into trouble. Okay. So with this in mind, let's look at our first negative result, which shows that learning to stabilize linear systems can be hard. The setup here is, again, we're going to assume that there's some, that our system is controllable, but it has this kappa time to controllability. This could range anywhere from 1 to n. And we're going to assume that we have these systems that are bound, bounded away, mu bounded away from being uncontrollable. Our first result shows that for any stabilization algorithm, I want to emphasize this, it doesn't matter what you do, you could apply what I showed you on the previous slide, you could do these squares, you could assume you have access to a quantum computer, it doesn't matter. The sample complexity is exponential in the time to controllability of my system. So that's what this math is basically telling me, that I need to get data that's at least as big as something that scales exponentially with the time to controllability of my system. All right, so in particular, if I can construct such an interesting system with a time to controllability that's equal to n, the state dimension, I'm in a lot of trouble here. Right, and so the proof for this result relies on constructing hard instances, two instances that are hard to tell apart from each other, and then applying one of these fancy information theoretic inequalities. Um, we're not going to go into the details of, the, of how you actually turn the proof out, but what we are going to look at is, in fact, one of these hard instances where you can get into trouble. Okay, so here the idea is that I have two systems that are very similar to each other. Um, the, the, the way to think about this is I have this one marginally stable node at the top, so this is like an integrator, and it's coupled to where I get to apply my actuation via this kind of chain of mu um, kind of shift registers, right? So every time it goes up a state, it gets multiplied by mu. Um, and you know, if you stare at this long enough, you recognize that a necessary condition for any controller to be stabilizing here is that the first entry in that controller has to have the opposite sign as that plus or minus mu term at the top there. Okay. So this tells me that I need to determine the sign of this, object, of this entry in blue. The challenge, though, is that this is going to be hard to do because whatever amount of energy I put into here, by the time it gets up to that top row, it's been decayed down by basically mu to the end. Right? So it's getting exponentially damped down. Um, and so I'll just add that I'm using this, this example just to illustrate the idea. There are examples where you have non-zeros along the diagonal as well. And so what this tells us is that if I have an unstable mode, that's only controllable, only excitable via what I'm going to call a sysid bottleneck, right? the fact that I have to actually identify that parameter and it's hard to excite, then this leads to hard stabilization problems. Right? So kind of the, the physical interpretation of this, maybe a little bit more of a robotics interpretation of this, is, is if I have a, let's say, chain of damped integrators, and I need to identify what's the, at the end of that chain of damped integrators, and I only get to actuate one end of it, this can get me into trouble. Now, when I started this talk, I motivated this kind of identity, this idea of identifying fundamental limits as being part of a co-design loop, right? And so the question is, is looking at this, what would I change, what could I change about this system to make it not hard to identify? How could I fix this? So for this example, a simple way to fix this would be to add an extra actuator that allows me to directly excite this mode right here, right? In that case, I don't have this exponential um, decay at uh, this exponential decay of my excitation it only goes through one hop. Right, so this is a silly example, but it kind of hints at this more uh, deeper principle, which is that if you're in this under excited sysid bottleneck, 
you may need to change your uh, your actuation structure. You may uh, you need to give yourself more degrees of freedom to how to actually excite your system to identify. Okay. So that's for just learning to stabilize a system offline. What about trying to learn an, an optimal controller online, trying to do adaptive control, trying to do online reinforcement learning? Um, we end up with you know, a very similar setup. So you know, again, time to controllability is this kappa term. We have these things that are bounded away from being uncontrollable. If you can ignore this bottom line here. It's just a technical condition, which means that we kind of have to puff this setup a little bit. What we can show is, again, that for any policy or algorithm, so any combination of exploration and excitation and exploitation or control, I'm going to have some regret that is again scaling exponentially in the um, scaling exponentially with the underlying um, time to controllability. So again, if I end up with a system that has this kappa term that leads to um, that is scaling like n, I'm in trouble. This becomes exponentially hard. Once again, I think the most instructive thing to do here is in fact to look at a hard instance, kind of the the, the hard instances that we use in our proof. And this looks somewhat different from the, the instant, the hard instance in learning to stable, and when you want to learn to stabilize. So the idea here is I have two decoupled systems. The one at the top, there's no dynamics. It's just my control input goes right into it. And then the bottom, the bottom system, I have a control input that comes in through the bottom, and it has to go up a chain of integrators, just a chain of integrators, right? Um, Really, for you know, the, to get the intuition about what's going on here, you can ignore the, de the, the decoupled system stuff. That's just kind of a theory trick. The important thing is this chain of integrators thing at the bottom. Okay, and so because of this structure, I have this optimal controller that is decoupled. And the class of systems that we consider is this really kind of clever geometric argument which says that I'm going to perturb my system so that I can't tell the difference between a closed loop system with the right A and B matrix and the wrong A and B matrix under the optimal controller. Now, the takeaway from this, what this means is that I actually have to explore away from the optimal controller. Even if I'm playing the optimal controller, I won't know it's optimal. So I'm going to have to deviate a little bit away from it so that I can identify the true A and B matrix. But the way we built this system is that for any additional kind of exploration or signal that I inject into my system, it's going to get blown up exponentially by this chain of integrators, right? And so you incur this exponential loss in like suboptimality every time you inject a little bit of excitation. And so what this tells me is that for online adaptive control, if I have modes that are too easy to excite, then this can lead to large regret. So in some sense, the opposite, as the, uh, the opposite of the setting for learning to stabilize the system. And similarly, you know, what we want to do here is try to identify what we could do to fix this, to make it easy. Anybody have any ideas what, we, what you might want to do here? That's okay. Um, so one thing that you could do is you could introduce a little bit of damping. Right? If I add a little bit of, let's say, friction in my system so that as it goes up, it decays a little bit instead of being amplified, then everything's fine. So this is, again, an interesting example where maybe here I don't need to change my actuation structure, but I need to change the physics a little bit. Right? And I recognize that these are toy examples, right? These are just linear systems. But I think more broadly, these same kinds of principles can apply to, to general types of, set, of settings. Uh, and so that's something that we're looking at now is how do we extend this to more general systems. Um, I'll just finally add that we can also extend this similar type of analysis. And this will be a, we'll be presenting this at CDC um, in, in, in December to an analyzing policy gradients methods for LQR as well, both when I get to observe the full state and in the partially observed setting. I'm not going to show you the theory. What I'll instead show you are some experiments that we ran that kind of empirically verify that this is true as well. So what we did is we took this original kind of stick balancing problem that I started off the talk with, but to, um, and we actually built a, a, a custom PyBull environment that replicates it. So we were training perception-based and state-based controllers and the, uh, and the idea here is that this black part here, the controller doesn't get to see. Right? So if you look on the left here, the controller only gets to see this part. And this is meant to mimic this idea that I have a ball cap. Right? And in this case, we ran soft, act we, we, um, we ran, um, soft actor critic. And the result in terms of sample complexity, the number of episodes that we needed to run, was really, really striking in the sense that when L minus L0 is equal to 1, which is when I don't block anything out, I kind of zip right up to the optimal reward. 
right? And then as I make the system more and more fragile by making myself look lower and lower, the sample complexity curves get worse and worse until eventually I'm not even able to converge to an optimal. Right? And while we don't have a, a, a theoretical analysis for soft actor critic, what we conjecture is this idea that, um, that we can look at the fact that the variance in my gradient estimates blows up in the same way as, um, the pre uh, as I showed in the previous results is what's causing this problem. Causing this problem. So again, an example of how you know, a simple analysis leads to at least some plausible explanation of a, a richer empirical uh, problem. Okay. So we did it, we made it through the bad news. If I was gonna summarize what makes uh, bad optimal controllers hard to learn, it's if I have systems that are either extreme, either too excitable or not excitable enough, I can get into trouble. And if you actually look at the literature, most of the empirical examples that people use kind of sit in the middle. They're not super excitable, but they're also not super overly damp. Okay. So next, we're gonna move over to answering the, the, the positive side here, which is trying to understand when learning to control is easy. And to do this, we're going to use um, imitation learning as a case study. And now, I don't want to assume that anybody in the, in the audience is super familiar with imitation learning, so, although I'm sure many of you are. So I'm going to try to just kind of set the stage in terms of how we're, how we're going to be thinking about this. So in vanilla imitation learning, the idea is that I have some expert policy that I like. I deploy it on my system, and I use it to collect a bunch of data in labeled pairs, where this is the state trajectory. And this is the action that my expert takes at that given state. Okay, so I have these labeled pairs of uh, state and desired action. And a typical approach to behavior, uh, behavior cloning, which is a kind of basic version of imitation learning, is to solve a regression problem that kind of looks like this. I'm going to try to find some uh, policy that I have that matches my expert on my behavior. That's it. Just vanilla supervised learning on this set of labeled, labeled data. Um, now, in um, the most vanilla version of this, that's it. You get your pie hat out, you deploy it on your system, cross your fingers that things work. Um, people like imitation learning be, uh, 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 over re reinforcement learning uh, because oftentimes it's much more sample efficient when it does work. Uh, and it could also be used as a, an initial seed for reinforcement learning as well. Um, the challenge though is that um, imitation learning oftentimes fails and it fails really, really badly. Uh, and the reason for that is this idea of distribution shift. Right, so the data that I have access to to train my system on is generated by my expert control. Right, so it's all expert data. But I don't really actually care about my learned pi hat doing well on other expert data, which is what traditional supervised learning would be. What I actually care about is pi hat behaving well on data generated by pi hat. But this leads to this chicken and egg problem, right? Because I don't have pi hat yet, so how can I generate data to learn pi hat? Right? Um, and so maybe to kind of like illustrate this uh, a little bit more uh, visually, if I suppose that this is like a cartoon for my training data, my expert data, and I'll use this cloud as a cartoon for my expert um, distribution, my distribution over expert trajectories. Suppose I run my imitation learning task, and uh, now I start off from this new initial condition with the black dot here. Now my expert will take it to step in this blue arrow, because there's a little bit of error from learning, I end up where this red arrow takes me. Right? This is what my learn policy takes me. I'm still in the training distribution, so that's OK. My expert knows what to do, and I more or less know what to do as well. I make another small error. But now, because of this compounding of two small errors, I've somehow kicked myself outside of my training distribution. So whereas my expert might still know what to do, I now have not seen this, this data beforehand, so I maybe make a bit of a bigger error which kicks me out even further, which leads to an even bigger error, which causes failure. So this is really the, the thing that happens when imitation learning fails. You get this kind of cascading, compounding errors, uh, and things start, start initially looking good, and then they just kind of fail catastrophically. Again, this is not something new. I have not, I'm not the one who identified this. This is well recognized within the IL community. But our, I think, novel take on this is we're really trying to look at this from a control theoretic perspective and try to understand how do the properties of pi star, my expert, manifest themselves in the sample complexity events. How much data do I need to ensure that this doesn't happen as a function of the behavior of my expert? Okay, so, you know, again, as I mentioned, this is not something that is um, unknown to the community. Everybody in, who works in imitation learning knows that this idea of vanilla behavior cloning, which is what I just described on the previous slide, is sensitive to this idea of covariate shift. So people have come up with different ways of addressing this. One is, an, you know, one category of on policy method, something like Dagger, where, again, conceptually, the idea here is from time to time, I let my expert jump in and correct 
what my, the errors that my learn policy are making, and then maybe I fold that data back in and learn on that. Off policy approaches take a different approach. What they essentially do is they inject noise while I'm collecting my expert data to, in some sense, try to preemptively puff up my training distribution. Because I know I'm going to make some errors at training time, at test time, so maybe I'm just going to force my expert to make errors as well. Okay. Now, you know, ignoring the low-level details of these concepts, if we zoom out a little bit, the key idea in all of these things that work very well in practice, I'll mention, um, is that you're trying to show your learned policy how to recover from errors. Right? That's Roughly speaking, that's kind of what's going on underneath that. But if you're showing your learned policy how to recover from errors by injecting noise or making your uh, expert recover from a, a state that it wouldn't get to on its own, you're making an underlying assumption, right? And this is an implicit assumption that we're going to try to make explicit. This implicit assumption is that my expert can actually recover from errors, right? If I had a very sensitive expert, then if I injected noise, it would just break. Right? That's not very useful. So our goal here is going, to take, is going to be to take this implicit assumption and quantify it and try to understand how it manifests itself in terms of sample complexity. Okay, so the argument here is that there's a specific type of robust stability underneath the hood that we need our expert system to satisfy. So we're going to set up things a little bit more quantitatively now. We're going to just consider generic nonlinear systems. And the only source of randomness that we're going to consider here is going to be in the initial condition. So I'm going to assume that my initial conditions are going to be drawn from some random distribution, and this distribution won't change from training to testing. This distribution can be whatever you want it to be as long as it has compact support. Okay. And we're going to write down our control input, our policy, as a sum of two components. One is the actual policy, so this is going to be, let's say, our learned policy, or any generic test policy, and some additive perturbation. For now, we're just going to keep this as generic, but what we're going to use this for downstream is to actually capture our learning error. Now, the way we're going to characterize the behavior or the, the, um, the performance of a learned policy is going to be in terms of this imitation gap uh, quantity, where we're looking at the difference between our test trajectory and our expert trajectory. Now, I'm going to apologize for the slightly dense notation. Phi sub t is the state of my system at time t. The superscript here refers to the policy that's being played to generate the data. So this would be the state x of t under the policy pi star. And the first argument corresponds to the initial condition. And the second argument corresponds to the input perturbation sequence. Okay. I'll remind you of what all these things mean as we go. And again, I apologize. It's a lot of bookkeeping. But unfortunately, these things are actually kind of important. So we need to keep track of them. Okay. So our first step to tackling this problem is uh, you know the tried and true method of adding zero. Um, so we're going to take our test policy, our test policy pi, and rewrite it as our expert policy plus some mismatch on the trajectories generated by my test policy. Okay, we haven't done anything sophisticated here. Um, but what this allows us to do then is to rewrite our imitation gap as the difference between a perturbed expert trajectory, where the perturbation sequence is the mismatch between my learned and expert policy and a nominal expert trajectory. Now, the reason that we went through this kind of whole rigor maru here is that quantifying the balance between a nominal and perturbed trajectory from a nonlinear system is something that has been extensively studied in nonlinear robust control. And in particular, the tool used to deal with this is a notion of incremental input to state stability, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to call it delta ISS going forward. Here's the map describing it. If you've taken nonlinear control, you like this. If you haven't, you don't have to worry about it. Intuitively, what this is saying is that my system needs, uh, what we're assuming is that our expert leads to a delta ISS system, which means that if there are no disturbances driving my system, the behavior basically forgets its initial condition. So trajectories converge towards each other. Alternatively, if they start from the same initial condition, that if I add a little bit of perturbation, I can quantify very cleanly the effect of that perturbation on the deviation between the two trajectories. For our purposes, we really only need this, this, um, this characteristic here, which is quantified by this gamma function, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Okay, so under the assumption, though, that I have a closed-loop policy that leads to this notion of delta ISS, which I'm going to mention, by the way, also is very, very mild. There are versions of this that are very strict that you know, imply exponential convergence, but this, the things on the right-hand side here can be arbitrarily kind of slow and kind of poorly conditioned. Then I can rewrite my imitation gap 
by leveraging this idea as this gamma function, which is a quantitative measure of my expert robustness, um, acting on the mismatch in my policies. So summarizing this, what this is saying is that if I assume that my expert leads to this delta ISS closed loop system, I can write my expert, I can bound my, um, I can bound my imitation gap by some function that scales with the, the robustness of my expert. So you can think of this as the amount that um, disturbances are amplified. So if we assume that our disturbances aren't too big, then let's say like gamma equal to x squared is really good. It's going to take something small and make it even smaller. Gamma equal to like x to the half is not as good. It's going to take something small and make it big. Okay. And the challenge, though, is that the argument here is still this policy mismatch under my test policy pop. So this is data that I don't have access to during training. So the rest of the, the, the kind of fight here is going to be to deal with that term. So our first result was to show that you can actually deal with this by viewing imitation learning through an adversarial lens. So in particular, what we're able to show is that if I'm able to ensure that my test policy pi is approximately equal to my expert policy pi star, not just on the expert data, but on a small tube around this expert data. Right? And the kind of quantification of how close it has to be depends on the underlying expert robustness then this carries over and tells me, ensures that I have a small limitation gap at test time. So if I have this adversarial condition satisfied, then I know that the error that I see during training is indicative and predictive of the error that I will see at test time. At tra at test time. Okay? Now, the challenge though, is this is not an easy thing to optimize. Right? If any of you have played around with adversarial uh, um, deep learning, Putting a, a supremum over a norm ball inside of a minimization algorithm can be very, very challenging. And in this case, we would also involve a ton of calls to our expert policy, which can be quite difficult to, to do in practice. So the approach that we take is to, in fact, is to instead take a Taylor, Taylor series of what's inside of that supremum and show that if you do things in the right way, you can, in fact, still ensure that you have this bound that you want. So the idea here is I start with this policy mismatch under the test policy pi. And I take a Taylor series around the expert, the, the expert data. Right, so I end up with this term that characterizes the policy mismatch under my expert. Then I end up with this Jacobian term that characterizes the mismatch of the Jacobian on my expert and my learned policy. And then I have my imitation gap showing up here. So the good news is, is that I, these things that are underlined in blue, they're defined on my training data. So these are things that I can actually bound and deal with using traditional tools from statistical learning here. The bad news, though, is that I've now got this kind of implicit bound on my imitation gap. It shows up on both sides of the inequality. But if you stare at this long enough, you may be able to convince yourself that if this is not too big, and this is not too big, then I can actually invert this and get something that's useful. And so this leads to what we call, ta what we, what we, um, to, to what we call Taylor series imitation learning, or TASL. And the idea here is that to ensure robustness to distribution shift, you want the pth order Taylor series expansion of your learned policy and your expert policy to match. All right, so we can define corresponding p tassel loss functions that go up and ensure that the zero, first, second, et cetera der derivative of your um, policy and expert policy match define the corresponding ERO problem. If we concretize this a little bit more, if we consider a very robust setting where, for example, this um, amplification or attenuation of disturbances is quadratic. So this is very, very robust, right? So I think of like 0.1, I square that, it's 0 0.01. So I'm doing a good job of suppressing the effects of disturbances. Then we can actually show that just vanilla behavior cloning is enough, right? So we were excited to see that because this seems to give an indication as to why sometimes behavior cloning works really well. Right? And if you look at the settings where it does work really well, it tends to be in settings where the underlying system that you're trying to imitate is very robust. In contrast, if I have something that's a little bit less robust, let's say linear, and this is actually very common for robotic systems, if I have a control affine system that's locally stable around any trajectory, um, then it'll satisfy this. Then what we show is that you in fact need to solve not just behavior cloning, but Jacobian cloning. So you want to make sure that not just the policy, but it's Jacobian match that of the expert. And we can put all of this into a general statement and give you probabilistic end-to-end -end bounds that show that with probability at least one minus delta, if n is large enough, and where large enough actually scales with the underlying robustness properties of your system, then you can ensure small limitation. Okay, now before I move on to 
just showing you some quick experiments, I think it's worth discussing the assumption that I get access to this jiggle. Right? This is not a broadly applicable assumption. If my expert is a human, it's very hard to get my hands on the Jacobian of a human's policy. Right? That being said, there are still interesting use cases where this could be used. Um, if you have something like ILQR or nonlinear MPC that you like, but it's too computationally heavy to be, be deployed in real time, this is a way to. This is one way to kind of lighten that load. Um, the other thing about this is that we don't actually need these. This term to go to zero. We just need it to get su to be sufficiently small. Which means that if you only have access to, let's say, Oracle uh, expert calls, you can instead replace this with a finite difference approximation. And if you combine this with ideas from sketching, from randomized linear algebra, you can show that, in fact, per data point, you maybe need like five or 10 random calls to your expert. And this gives you a good, a, a good approximation. And we have empirical verification on this. But I just wanted to kind of clarify that, because there is this kind of underlying assumption that I get access to some measure of the Jacobian, the local change in my policy, which is not always a but you know, from my perspective, the exciting thing here was really this clean connection from the underlying dynamical systems, nonlinear robust stability property of the closed loop expert to the upstream sample complexity. And this is one of these rare cases where we actually did the theory first and then defined the algorithm. And the algorithm basically worked right out of the box. So that was also very exciting for us. So let me just show you some quick examples here in, in Mujoko, where we've kind of qualitatively ordered the different environments from uh, least robust to mo most robust to least robust. Um, and what I'm showing you in these different rows is behavior cloning of just vanilla versus behavior cloning augmented with the Jacobian term. And the nice thing about this is it's not really even an algorithm. It's just a, a, an additional regularizer, if you will, that you add to your loss term. So you can integrate it into any other algorithm that you like. So we also did it with Dart, which is one of these offline things that injects noise, and also did it with Dagger. And what you see is that, you know, in some sense, as the theory predicts, for Swimmer, which is in some sense the most robust thing you could hope for. It's a, it's a worm uh, swimming around on the ground in a viscous fluid, like, as robust as it gets. There's no real difference, right? You don't get much of a win. However, if you look at, let's say, half cheater, humanoid, the gap between behavior cloning and that with just adding this Jacobian term makes a huge difference. Okay. So this really tells you this, the importance of, some, of you know, one way to think about this is we're translating the local correction that the expert would take over to the learned policy. All right, and then finally, I'll just end with a quick little video kind of showing this in practice. So the top row is behavior cloning, the bottom row is um, behavior cloning augmented with the Jacobian. So you can see that top row, everything kind of fall, fails very quickly, whereas in the bottom row, things go quite well. I'll, I'll mention that this was done off of just 12 training trajectories of 100 time steps. Right, so we're getting pretty sample efficient um, imitation learning going on here. Uh, and then just to show that we're not cherry picking our videos, our humanoid does fall eventually, but it lasts a lot longer. And after like 15 training trajectories, our humanoid doesn't fall anymore. Okay. I'll also mention that all of this code is uh, available on GitHub, very easy to use. So if you have uh, settings where you'd like to try this out, uh, just go to the repo, clone it locally, and you should be good to go. Okay, so I'll just quickly end by saying that in addition to Im imitation learning, we've also seen other scenarios where incremental stability leads to easy learning. So we have results on uh, non-parametric learning of nonlinear dynamics, as well as showing that adversarial learning is as easy as nominal learning in the dynamical system setting if you have this underlying notion of incremental stability. Um, so if we now zoom back out, and I think I'm just a little over time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, you know, we start off with this informal meta theorem, and what we've nailed down here is that Controllers that are incrementally robustly stable are easy to learn, and this extends more broadly to other settings as well. And then if we kind of bring this back, we also remember that if systems are too excitable or not excitable enough, then we have controllers that are hard. So while not a complete picture, this starts to give us a good idea of when we should expect easy learning and when we should expect hard learning. And in particular, in the hard learning setting, we also saw that small changes to the, 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 the dynamics of the system, be it either adding an additional actuator or adding a little bit of friction, could bring you out of this hard regime back to the easy regime. So I'll just wrap up by thanking all of my amazing collaborators. So the top row here, especially the top two on the left, are those who are responsible for the, the work from the first half of the talk. And then uh, Daniel and Thomas uh, are um, the, those mostly responsible for the imitation learning work. And then I have some other collaborators as well who played an important part in this work. Uh, I'll just end with a couple of shameless plugs. If any of you are going to CDC in, uh, in a few weeks, 
we have a really nice uh, workshop on statistical learning theory for control. It's a kind of companion workshop to go with the survey article that we just put out. Really fantastic speakers from all over the place that are coming to this. Uh, and then last but not least, we're also going to be hosting the uh, fifth annual conference on learning for dynamics and control at Penn. Um, the submission deadline was just extended to November 23rd. It's going to be a really fun time. Um, so if you're working in this space, please consider submitting your best work to this conference. It'll be good. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. And thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. So that means it was either really clear or I lost you all. <laughs> How does data augmentation? Yeah, so we tried that. We initially thought that data augmentation plus really low test training loss would work because it should in some sense imply that you have this small Jacobian. We couldn't get it to work. So in theory, yeah, it should work, but we just haven't been able to get, to get it to do anything easy, uh, anything useful. Yeah. They, they are, I mean, it's, it's challenging because what you really want to do with the data augmentation to imitate our result, right, is you want to have very, very small perturbations that you, um, so that you locally kind of approximate the Jacobian. Um, that being said, um, these ideas do combine with data augmentation approaches. So something like Dart, which really, what, what it tries to do is it tries to inject noise that is uh, going to match, in some sense, the test time errors. You can add our additional regularizer on top of it and it plays well. You can see in certain settings that actually leads to a nice benefit. Um, so you know, I, I view them as complementary. But yeah, it's, it's actually, we're, we're still not sure why it doesn't work in practice just directly. Great question. I have a question on the implementation gap. Yeah, like if, if, you, if, you, if you have inject disturbances into the system, if you have multimodal policies, if Disturbances that you're enjoying, like are different, then you can end up with a higher imitation gap without the imitation gap being potentially expressive of something going going wrong. Right? That if there is something at the road that you need to, to yeah. drive around, you could drive around on the left or on the right. Yeah, no, I, and that's a great question, right? So there are some limitations to this work, right? Which is what we're we're really looking at this on a per trajectory basis. And I think what you really want to do to address these multimodality questions is really try to actually look at the distribution. Yeah, the the the, 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 the I'm gonna call it like the imitation distribution gap, yeah, right? That's actually something that we're looking at right now, and I think we're making some progress on it. But uh, we don't have a I don't have a good answer to that from the perspective that I presented today. And I guess it's also hard because you have to have good metrics and distributions, and there are many to choose from. Definitely, yeah, definitely. The other thing that's challenging is that, unfortunately, this idea of um, incre like this delta ISS idea, this idea of nonlinear robust stability, it actually doesn't extend very gracefully to stochastic settings. Um, so there's a reason that we actually limited our randomness to just the initial condition. If you actually allow per process noise to, to be introduced, there isn't a graceful way of handling it right now. You, you would essentially incur, the analysis would say that you're incurring some kind of bias due to the noise, which where in practice, whereas in practice you shouldn't. So there's a little bit of gap in the theory there for addressing that. Can you give us like trajectories that are close to you? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. We're actually looking, we're just exploring right now heuristics that allow that would allow us to approximate the Jacobian using data that could be collected, for example, from a human. Um, so the idea that you suggested is one we're looking at. Uh, we're still kind of just in the experimenting phase. Um, I think the downside of this is we're probably not going to have any, any strong theoretical guarantees, but I'm really okay with that if we can find something that works well in practice. Um, I mean, one thing that I'll, I'll maybe just very quickly add is um, this idea of showing the controller how to recover is applicable and useful beyond kind of this vanilla imitation learning setting that I showed about. So I didn't, I didn't talk about it today because I didn't really have time. But I had this paper out, we had this paper out um, with my collaborators from Google where we actually um, tried to inform how teleoperators should collect data. So basically they're given some, some, some play area where they're supposed to pick up uh, a shirt. And we wanted to inform how, how, what kind of data they should generate for us to be able to train an offline RL algorithm. And it turned out the right kind of data is one where 
they go down, they fail, they come back up, and then they correct themselves. So it's again this idea of showing how to locally correct in the face of failure that I think is important. So none of the theory applies, but conceptually it was the same kind of idea.